If you don't know Peter Young yet on Twitter or, or if you're not following him and you're really missing out, you should definitely follow him. He has one of the most succinct educational Twitter threads and articles he writes on principles of Austrian economics, Austrian School of Economics, on taxation, on the individual sovereign, on technological innovation, connection with Bitcoin. So these are all the topics we're going to talk about, which I'm really excited about. Looking forward to talk to him in this, in this episode for the first time with Peter Young. So... Uh, without further ado, um, I'm going to have this awesome target. If you love this episode, please give it a five-star review on iTunes or Apple podcast. And let me know if you have any questions or comments. Really looking forward to that. And uh, here you go. My talk with Peter Young. All right. Welcome to the show, Peter Young. Thank you so much for coming to my show. Uh, I've been really, uh, you know, been really uh, eager to, you know, to talk to you for some time now because I've been reading your Twitter thread. Um, Peter, th welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing really well. Thanks, Kayvan. And thanks for inviting me on. I'm a big fan of your podcast. Been, uh, been listening on the sidelines for some time. So it's great to finally uh, be on here as a guest as well. Yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure is totally mine. So Peter, uh, you've written some really succinct, compact Twitter threads, which every, I think, mortal human being can understand. And this is, you know, the, the, the crux of education. Like, how do, you, how do you communicate, how do you translate all these, let's just call it theoretical material, you know, from Austrian principles of Austrian economics, you know, which is really uh, essentially very rational, very logical. Yeah and and but but you know understandable you know it's like uh, it's like intuitive it's like intuitive understand but still for, for a lot of people i think uh maybe it needs to be somehow uh, translated or or maybe more in touch with the reality they are in and we could be in you know so yeah let's just start off about your background because i'm really curious how did you get into austrian economics why did you start writing because you have also an uh, medium uh, art um what do you call medium link uh the austrian three dot medium dot com link um yeah let's just start off with that well i first came to austrian economics uh through my time in china i previously worked with um, the British Embassy and with an innovation organization uh, representing them in Beijing. And during that time, I became quite uh, familiar with lots of the techniques that were used by the government to undertake economic analyses and develop business cases for potential funding. And as I got more into that, and as I had to uh, sign off on projects or propose projects with these kinds of analysis underpinning them, I became more and more interested in the theory. And I have to say, I was slightly skeptical of some of it because working at the coalface, I saw what projects were actually able to do in reality and was able to contrast that to what was projected in the kind of business cases and, and, and with the economic assumptions lying behind them. And the more I looked into that, the more I discovered that it had some, it had some problems and I discovered this alternative school of thought, the, the Austrian school of economics. And once I got into that, I realized that that just had far more explanatory power. It had made so much more intuitive sense. And when you looked at the world, uh, it provided a much more coherent set of explanations for the economic phenomena we see around us. And so it was really the sense of being involved in government really that brought me to to thinking about the austrian school and ultimately that resulted in some quite big changes in my personal life um and i'm still on that journey at the moment but i do highly recommend uh, looking into the austrian school for those people who haven't haven't yet uh, discovered it Great. So um, you also in some in one of your Twitter threads, you talked about uh, Hong Kong, because I know, you know, you, you uh, we just we just mentioned, you know, before the recording that you had a, had done a, a, a talk with Daniel Prince on his on his awesome podcast, which I'm eager to to listen to later on. Uh, but you talk about also Hong Kong, uh, which, yeah. which stands out, you know, with its, uh, let's say, really progressive or I don't know, more uh, progressive, let's say, tax policies, economics, even I think it, school education. 
but I think there's, uh, as we know, you know, with all the oppression going on with the human rights violations. So there are some things that which cannot be really fixed with economic policies or, you know, uh, political uh, solutions uh, that they're actually been implementing. Um, so can you can you talk about Hong Kong a little bit? Yeah. Well, Hong Kong is one of my favorite places in the world to visit. It's just a super fascinating place for a lot of reasons. During the Second World War, well, Hong Kong has been a, became a British colony under um, circumstances that I don't think many people would seek to defend uh, today, but it became a British colony uh, after the, the Opium Wars, the island itself, and that was back in uh, so those wars started in 1839, and then there were a second set of uh, wars uh, in the 1850s that expanded the territory of Hong Kong. And then finally, there was this um, set of treaties signed, uh, treaties of Tianjin in 1898, which created the sort of full Hong Kong that we see today. So throughout the 19th century, Hong Kong was becoming, um, you know, gradually larger and larger under British control, still a very small territory, roughly half the size of London, but it um, kind of remained this uh, trade trading port, essentially, a British a free trading port in the region uh, up until the Second World War. But during the Second World War, it was occupied by the Japanese and they really um, left it in a very poor state after, after, um, after the war because there was a lot of actual um, destruction that took place. But after the Second World War finished, they had this fascinating character called uh, Sir John Copperthwaite, who became the um, financial secretary of Hong Kong. And he was really dominant in Hong Kong's economic policy from the 1945 through to about, um, through to the 1960s. And one of the things that, that he ended up doing, like he, was a, he was a huge fan of Adam Smith. So he wasn't so much an Austrian, but he was really uh, steeped in, in the classical school um, you know, classical economics. And so Adam Smith, you know, he's got some problems and Austrians have, have issues with his theory of value, but he is certainly someone that endorses free trades and has quite a liberal idea about how, how markets should operate. So this guy, John Copperthwaite, had this kind of tendency towards laissez-faire, towards letting the, 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 the territory, um, you know, solve its problems through market mechanisms. And at the same time, there was this kind of dynamic going on. Like if you think about what was happening in Europe post uh, World War II, particularly in Britain, there was a real drive towards Keynesianism as socialism. And a lot of the policies we pursued in Britain um, were, you know, entailed a very large expansion of the state. That was when you had very large um, rollout of the welfare state, nationalization of major industries. And so, one of the advantages that Hong Kong had was that in addition to having this very free market oriented uh, financial secretary, it was also a very long way away from Britain, a very long way away from uh, what was happening in, in North America and in, in Western Europe. And so whilst a lot of the countries over there were, were, trend, were uh, focused on domestic issues and, and focused on moving towards a more status model, Hong Kong was kind of ignored and partly out of necessity really because people weren't really that interested in what was happening in this far-flung uh, part of Asia. Um, so they just let uh, Hong Kong get on with it. And what's fascinating is the, is the extent to which that completely transformed the, uh, you know, the society of Hong Kong and how phenomenally successful it was. Um, there's an author called Neil Monterey who's written a book about that compares Hong Kong to Cuba. And it basically in, in the 1960s, both of them took these kind of radically different paths. Cuba took a status path and Hong Kong took a, a laissez-faire path, shall we say, or at least a very small government, government path. And uh, the, the difference, you know, only really manifests itself in uh, one to two percent difference in GDP growth per year, but obviously that compounds. And essentially, um, whilst Cuba is, is currently 
I think the statistic was Cuba is currently twice as wealthy as it was in the 1960s now, but Hong Kong is something like a factor of 14. So I think there's a difference of like a factor of seven between how how successful these 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 different countries of like um, that, that undertook changes at similar times have, have been able to achieve. So that's a really fascinating study. But Hong Kong um, really has been hugely successful. It started off as a British colony. Um, it was destroyed during World War II, and it's um, now one of the richest territories in the world. And it's surpassed the UK uh, as a whole, its former colonial master, if you like, uh, in terms of GDP per capita. Um, there's, of course, a lot that's happened in recent years with Hong Kong that's more controversial. But um, I'd, I'd just like put that kind of historical overview out there to explain why Hong Kong is so important in teaching us about uh, Austrian economics and free markets. Oh, that's fa fascinating. So um, since we are already talking about Hong Kong, let's just, I mean, we're going to talk about lots about Bitcoin, of course, but how, where's the position of Hong Kong when it comes to Bitcoin adoption or, you know, institutional adoption? And by the way, today is my birthday and today also, oh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, and today also starts the open sourcing of micro MicroStrategy's uh, playbook uh, to, uh, today, February 3rd and 4th. Um, so um, I'm really optimistic. I'm really excited what's going to happen because I think there's going to be a lot of institutional FOMO. So let's just stick to Hong Kong. Well, what's the position of Hong Kong when it comes to Bitcoin, like people yeah. or institutions? Well, Hong Kong, as far as I'm aware, is, is fairly liberal on, on Bitcoin at the moment. Um, you see quite a lot of um, prominent advertising in Hong Kong about, about Bitcoin related stuff, uh, which is quite encouraging. Uh, in mainland China, of course, which kind of nominally, uh, well, it's, Hong Kong is now part of, of, of mainland China. Um, and so there's this kind of one country, two systems uh, set up they have there that governs the politics. So Hong Kong has a, has a high degree of autonomy. Many would argue that's getting gradually eroded, but it does have this degree of auto autonomy from China. But what I've seen, most of my time has been based in mainland, mainland China. And what I see in China is uh, that there has been this crackdown on exchanges operating in China, which is quite well known. Um, when I was living in Beijing, we used to have a, a quite a large Bitcoin meetup. And uh, after all the ICO stuff um, with you know, other, other cryptocurrencies in uh, 2017, 2018, um, the government of Beijing said that we are no longer allowed to host any anything related to blockchain or, or you know, cryptocurrency. Um, and of course, they don't distinguish between any of that stuff and Bitcoin. So there has been there have been moves like that, which kind of discourage people in mainland China from uh, um, from working with Bitcoin and from publicizing it. But they do still allow all the mining operations to continue. And so there are big companies based in China uh, that, you know, manufacture mining equipment and, and undertake large mining operations. Um, but the government is, is, is wary about this. You know, China, we've got to remember that China, the Yuan, isn't a free-floating international currency. They still have uh, strict capital controls with the, with the um, Yuan in China. And so there's a lot of interest from people within China. You know, you've got this huge burgeoning middle class people getting rapidly uh, wealthy uh, by the you know by the hundreds of millions in china and they're looking for ways to diversify their risk essentially because whilst china has become much more liberal since the reform and opening period of the late uh, 1970s uh, it's still a pretty precarious environment and it's still very much in control of the of the communist party uh, they're very powerful and they, they generally will leave things um you know things they like you, you can actually do quite a lot i would say that sometimes you can do a lot more than in the uk for example in in the construction sector but if you do get on the wrong side of people um they can come down on you very hard and there's a lot of people that just want to kind of have their assets in different places and Bitcoin represents a way you can do that. You can take wealth offshore, or you can take wealth away from the kind of RMB system. So what I'd say is that that's been going on in China. 
Um, that's happened much less in Hong Kong. Hong Kong is obviously this international financial center and has this uh, reputation that it wants to maintain about uh, being liberal with regard to financial innovation. So, so far, I haven't seen too many uh, really worrying trends in, in Hong Kong. But I do think that the trends of government, this, this is kind of relates perhaps to some of the stuff you discussed with Neil Woodfine in your podcast back in October. Um, you know, th there, I do think there is, there is a kind of, uh, there will be a backlash from governments against Bitcoin because it essentially undermines the standard business model because financial uh, monetary seniorage is, is such an important source of government revenue that if you take that away, um, you will force government to um, tax people in a different way, or you'll force governments to um, shrink in size, essentially. So although things at the moment seem okay, I would just say that, like Neil, I expect there to be developments in the years ahead that make things slightly, slightly rocky um, regarding attempts by governments to, to regulate and control Bitcoin. Yeah, I'm totally with you in, on this point. And, and I think that's an aspect or some of these aspects in regards to the, what, what, what should we call it? Control structures. I don't know what else to call it because it goes so deep to the, to the power structure of, of the existing whatever monetary, financial, yeah. military, industrial, corporate complex. <laughs> There's just, you know, a huge mega complex, which I'm sometimes concerned about, like, you know, I have no concern and I told, you know, I, I talked to a lot of, you know, people on my show. I, I said, you know, I have no, um, no doubt that number go up, you know, the price of Bitcoin, it will somehow ossify, it will uh, root itself. Um, now, you know, institutions coming in, but what I'm really concerned about, and I think it's a totally different dimension is like, what will the, how will the control structures react to that? Will it, we be nationally, supranationally, globally? Uh, you know what I'm getting at? Like, yeah. do you sometimes think about that? Because if this is about, I think this is, you know, Bitcoin is not just about money or the economy, you know, and, and the transformation of our of our societal being, of our of our, uh, of our free, free market, which we, we don't have yet, uh, but which we hopefully going to evolve into. And this is why I'm a huge fan, you know, of, of Jeff Booth's uh, comprehension and his communication, how he communicates it, like we, uh, like uh, technolo technology is by nature deflationary, and once we usher into this deflation economics with uh, it, with zero to one technological innovation, which is already you know uh, um, ev evolving fast and faster, but I think people have a hard time understanding how this un will unleash Bitcoin, how Bitcoin, the hardest and scarcest money. Uh, will unleash these powers so we become um, really a prosperous, abundant, blossoming society in totality. Yeah. Sorry, that was a lot in, into one <laughs> sentence. But. No, no, that's it's something worth considering, certainly. This is one of the things that James Dow Davison and uh, William Rees Mogg write about in The Sovereign Individual. The way in which the rise of digital currencies will um, kind of force a transformation of the way we think about uh, government and the way in which government operates. Um, so one of the things they say is that, fascinating book, by the way, I recommend that you, uh, the, the people that haven't go, go ahead and, and check it out. It was written in 1997 and the book uh, was essentially coming about just at the, the time when we were in the lead up to the dot com bubble and the internet was uh, becoming a sensation and they basically foresaw the rise of cyber cash um, a decade before satoshi nakamoto wrote the uh, bitcoin white paper and they said that this is going just going to be a thing that that happens um, they understood the potential for public key cryptography to serve as a means of creating digital currency uh, they had a. They even went into a discussion in that book about the mechanisms for cryptography, which they they based it theirs on uh, prime number uh, 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 cryptography, which um, which is one method of encryption. But Bitcoin uses a slightly different one, elliptical um, curve um, uh, cryptography. But 
the detail they go into is quite interesting in how it will work. And I think it represents quite an amazing amount of foresight. But one of the things they say is that with cyber currencies, you're essentially forced to undertake transactions peacefully. And that's, to me, one of the things that makes Bitcoin the most exciting. Because under the current system, there are essentially two ways that you can get your hands on money. The first way is to find someone who will give it to you voluntarily. The second way is to find the money printer and stand near to it and serve the people that stand near to the money printer. When you have, when you remove the latter, all of the things that are done just that aren't necessarily adding social value, that are just expanding the money supply, um, are eliminated. And you just have the voluntary system, the system that is based on providing value in exchange for value. And because Bitcoin is a system whereby all you need to own Bitcoin as a bearer instrument is a set of passwords that you can write on a piece of paper or store in your head or memorize, uh, it becomes harder and harder for people to take away uh, what you've acquired yourself. And so what that does is that limits exchange to voluntary transactions. So people uh, can only acquire something of yours if they do something for you. And that creates a mutually enforcing uh, network of people adding value uh, for each other. And of course, one of the principles of Austrian economics uh, which is one way in which Austrian economics contrasts to kind of modern um, standard Keynesian economic theory is that Austrians believe in asymmetry of valuation in transactions. So it's not the case that when I buy a book for £10, that book is worth £10 and there's an equivalence of value. That's not the case because if it was the case that I valued the book and, and the 10 pounds the same, then I wouldn't undertake the transaction. I wouldn't go out of my house in the morning and, and I'd feel indifferent about having one or the other. Whereas in reality, transactions take place because one person values uh, one thing high, higher than the other. Um, and each person has something that the other one values. And so each time a transaction takes place, you're getting more and more value added. And that just creates, that creates economic growth, more satisfaction in society. And that's one of the things that Bitcoin brings about. And so to round this back to your question, because Bitcoin is, is so much harder to confiscate and censor, it means that this mechanism, which governments can use, which you can call you know, financing by the printing press, and which enriches so many influential people in society, such as the financial sector, such as large corporations that can, can borrow cheaply because they have higher credit ratings because they can issue their own bonds, et cetera. These kinds of activity will be subject to real market forces and they'll be forced to provide value in proportion to what they actually offer to the citizens. There won't be the option of saying, we're gonna force you to give up your, your funding because we believe this is the right service. You know, if you don't believe that a certain government service um, or a certain government war or a certain government uh, program that you regard as wasteful is good value for money, then you don't have to be a part of it and contribute to it. And that's something that I think is really powerful, has a lot of potential to do good in the world. But at the same time, there is an entire system, as you, as you mentioned, a kind of uh, complex of people who have huge vested interests, who have based their prestige, their wealth, and, and in many ways, their, their personal identity, their values on this existing system. And if you introduce something that can potentially alter that, um, then um, that's quite threatening to them. But the sovereign individual says that this is kind of an inevitable thing that will happen. We're gonna move towards a much more um, libertarian world where there will be kind of much more operation in the cyber economy and governments will have to kind of compete for customers, compete for, uh, companies and individuals to go and move go and move there. So this will be a, a sort of new normal. I personally think that 
this will be a very hard journey and it's not as inevitable as the authors make out but nonetheless it's really thoughtful uh, book and and certainly worth um worth thinking about the way in which their their arguments uh, may, may well play out in reality yeah it's been a while i read the book and uh, i don't remember the details but do you rem do you know like uh, uh, like out of your head right now what 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 they said about the challenges coming up like uh, you know government or nation states versus the individual because it's been a while i read the book do you know any like well the challenge they they allude to is that it becomes harder and harder for governments to control their revenue streams. So with the current system, well, the current system we have is really based on a legacy whereby the vast majority of people are kind of fixed in an individual country and they operate in that country. And so thereby they have to file their, their business reports and their, and their tax locally. And that's the case for the vast majority of people. But as we move more and more into a cyber economy, um, you know, say you and I interact and there's a, there's a transaction that takes place in Bitcoin. Um, you know, I'm in the UK, you're in Austria. Um, we, we might transact, but, you know, is that an Austrian, is that something that the Austrian government gets money for or the British government gets money for? Um, or should they get any money for that transaction between two voluntary um, people entering into a voluntary exchange? Um, basically what the the book says is that that will become much more difficult for governments to control when you have a system of cyber currency. And it says that essentially throughout history, and talks particularly about the Industrial Revolution and the way in which uh, during the Industrial Revolution, because you had factory towns that kind of built or were built around um, you know, natural resource flows, like, um, like coal, for example, like mining towns, uh, this created these kind of clusters of economic activity, which, although this didn't happen immediately, it made it easier and easier for governments to sort of extract economic value from those uh, individual individual sites, because it wasn't the case like you had during the uh, period where we had a strongly agricultural economy, where everything was just dispersed across the whole country. It was very hard to administer. Like suddenly you had these very dense urban centers, and that made it easy for for governments to grow in size and governments have grown in size really quite astonishingly when you look at the figures i mean in britain for example we went through the industrial revolution with a government that according to most estimates accounted for less than 10 percent of the national product in terms of the amount of spending it, it undertook um for, for most of the 19th century significantly lower than that but we had a very small state and it's the same in in the us the us had an even smaller state during the 19th century and, and grew much more quickly as as a result but it was really during the uh, first world war that things started to change um we had a large expansion of things like income tax um during the um during the first world war although it existed before that it was ex expanded then and then during the second world war again there was this this very large expansion and and the result is that countries like the us germany france that had a uh, percentage of government activity as a uh, as um so government activity as a percentage of national product around sort of 10 12 8 percent all going up to between say 35 percent, which is roughly what the us is now to almost 60 percent um as it is in France today. Uh, so you've had this huge expansion of power. Um, this has been possible due to the kind of social organization that we've had clustering of resources in particular place, which are capital intensive, so kind of easier to capture by government. And what the sovereign individual says is that because the overall world economy is moving more and more towards intangible production, like things like Netflix, where um, we will pay pay a subscription fee and we'll consume a resource that could be created all over the world. Um, things like that become harder and harder for governments to control and to tax. And obviously, there's a lot of controversy about companies like Apple and Amazon and you know, people saying they don't pay the right amount of, amount of tax. And I think that's in part of a result of the, the rise of the digital economy. 
And so the sovereign individual really hones in on that aspect and says, that's going to be a problem because when you've got so much intangible creation, it's harder to monitor and control. And at the same time, you'll have transactions taking place in cyber cyberspace using cyber currency. And if those are uncensorable in the way that we know that Bitcoin, Bitcoin currently is, um, then that does create a quite a seismic shift in the power dynamics. Yeah. And, you know, um, I've, I've listened to some other podcasts and there are more and more, you know, macro analysts or Bitcoiners always saying that the, the market capitalization of Bitcoin is just way too small. It's like what, 600, 700 billion. So it's a drop, it's a little drop, you know, on a hot stone. And uh, so it, it doesn't really pose um, itself as a threat to the, you know, to the nation state, to the supranational organizations, to the central banking system yet. So this will be, and maybe this is the reason I was, because we were going back and forth on Twitter with someone, I think the guy is called Schopenhauer or something. And I said, and I think it was with Ben Kaufman, sort of a Twitter communication. And, and someone said, well, uh, Michael Saylor is just sort of trying to downplay it in a way. I'm not I'm rephrasing it. So, so I said, oh, that's, that's an interesting point. So he's trying sort of to keep a low profile and keep going, you know, with the statements of regulation and, you know, and we got to, and, and that, and that actually Bitcoin is not a currency, but a store of value. And maybe this is the way to Trojan horse Bitcoin, you know, into the, <laughs> into a more localized decentralized economy and then it, it once it takes foot and once it rooted itself then it's it's too late you know to reverse process this whole thing is that the is that the process you're seeing like they could downplay keep a low profile so this is becoming quite quite speculative i guess but i personally feel that at the moment so much stuff going on particularly with the coronavirus situation we find ourselves in people are just distracted by that Bitcoin has sailed up in 2020 from, you know, in the sing in the sort of um, you know below 10,000 right the way up through to 40,000 US dollars, and in 2017 that was all over. It was all over the news when you saw similar increases. But people are just preoccupied at the moment. They're focused on. They have this kind of myopic focus on coronavirus, and they seem to uh, want to make ever think about that and things like bitcoin that are happening in the background um, have largely been passed by unnoticed by the vast majority of like mainstream media you get the occasional thing in the ft or in the guardian um you know the occasional article but it's still coronavirus you know top top 20 stories on the bbc 18 of them are coronavirus related so i think this is kind of sailing under the radar for the moment but I think it's inevitable, unfortunately, that governments will start to see that this is just growing and growing and growing. Because as long as Bitcoin keeps doing what it has been doing uh, since it was launched, uh, which is putting out one block every 10 minutes, just as it was planned to, um, remains unhackable, remains uncensorable, then because of the dynamics of the stock to flow ratio and the supply and demand dynamics, you know, I just think it will outcompete the existing monies in the same way that gold outcompeted all other monies throughout history, because it had the most reliably low stock to flow ratio of any commodity. And when that starts to become obvious, in particular, when the huge amount of government debt that has been acquired. I mean, we've seen in the year 2020, uh, government debt in developing con countries go up by around 20% from something like 105% of GDP uh, through to about 125. And we live in an environment where interest rates are super low, but you can't just keep adding debt indefinitely and expect interest rates to remain low. You can't defy the forces of gravity forever. And when that starts to happen, that's when governments realize that their very serviceable obligations at the moment suddenly become massive. And that's when I think you start to get social problems. And that's when you start to get 
governments panicking and they look for things to blame. And at times of financial crisis, especially if Bitcoin is becoming more and more significant, market cap passing a trillion, two trillion, whatever it happens to be, then Bitcoin is a very obvious target. It ticks all, it ticks a lot of boxes. You can say that, you know, criminals use it. You know, that's, that's one of the standard things. You can say that it contributes to climate change. Uh, you can say that it helps with money laundering. Uh, it undermines existing financial systems. You can talk about, you know, the pensions and there are lots of standard tactics that are used by people who want to, uh, who believe in a large role for the state in, in society. And I can see all of the, these arguments becoming directed at Bitcoin. And that doesn't mean that Bitcoin will necessarily um, be unable to surmount those, those difficulties, but it does mean that we are potentially on the road for some, some difficult years ahead. Uh, and it's something that I think Bitcoiners should be aware of as they invest, especially stuff like how you store your Bitcoin and um, what level of security you personally have when you when you hold it. Um, because it may be the case that there's this kind of gradual drip drip of regulation coming into it, which is the way that intervention tends to work. I mean, we've seen in, in the year 2020 that the way that narratives evolve in a way that's kind of gradually accumulates, but then you realize after one year, the life has completely changed. At the beginning of, of 2020, we were in a situation where we were talking about a temporary lockdown in order to flatten the coronavirus curve. And that's rapidly moved towards effectively long-term house arrest for large swathes of the population. Um, very graphic government advertising about coronavirus, um, you know, implying that you're that you're killing people by uh, being out on the streets uh, and uh, breaking the rules that they have they have set uh, for what they think is permissible and what isn't permissible. And this is something that's never happened really before in history. And it's quite, it demonstrates the way in which regulations can kind of come in step by step. I think if you imposed all of this stuff right at the beginning, there would have been resistance to it. But because you just did it step, by step by step by step we suddenly wake up in 2021 and society has been completely transformed um one of the things the other things is that at the moment it's um illegal for you to <laughs> to travel overseas without a kind of valid reason if you're a uk citizen um you have to show that you're going for work and you have to fill out a form to show that this is legitimate travel i mean these kinds of measures are pretty unprecedented for a country that's supposed to be associated with with classical liberalism at least um, and is regarded uh, particularly in Europe as kind of one of the more liberal countries um, in the region um, and I think to, to turn that back to Bitcoin we could gradually see you know some of the the KYC stuff getting stronger we could we could gradually see um, you know need to declare your Bitcoin holdings uh, another thing that you're you're seeing um, they're trying to introduce in the US is this um, uh, taxes on uh, undeclared earnings um, and stuff like that might start to be applied to Bitcoin or VAT even, you know, in the UK, um, gold is still free of VAT. So if I buy gold from a, from a website, I can, I can do that relatively near the spot price, but silver is subject to VAT. And there's no reason why they couldn't turn around tomorrow and say gold is now subject to VAT or um, Bitcoin is subject to VAT if we catch you. And so steps like this, I can see if they came out with an outright ban from the beginning, that might be problematic, but gradual steps can kind of reinforce these, um, these, these ideas in, in, the minds of, in the minds of people. And uh, so I do think there's, there's an argument, there's a moral argument to be won. And people like you know, yourself that run podcasts that try and get the message out there about what Bitcoin is to try and educate people about the positive social benefits it can have are playing a really important role because um, ultimately, if the population does become really hostile towards this, um, then it's going to be much more difficult, of course. Um, 
So that's just something that I, I think we should we should bear in mind when when thinking about the future. And this is so important while you you know talk about KYC and how you know and and by the way I listened to uh, an interview with Godfrey Bloom is that his name Godfrey Bloom yeah, yeah <laughs> he's amazing Bloom. I mean he's not a Bitcoin of course but he finally you know went a little bit into the rabbit hole and he had a talk with Stephen Levera I think another coming up with Alex Svetsky I'd love to have him on you know he's very probably very demanded uh, when it comes to interviews. But yep, yep. the thing is said, and I, I totally agree with him. This is the aspect that somehow in our Bitcoin eco chamber, you know, is is either I don't know negligently or in some fashion somehow neglected. To be honest with you, and he says, you know, well, yeah, maybe they can't get our Bitcoin or or our gold, but they can get to us. They can get to me. You know, you should definitely talk. You know, listen to his interview because he makes really some valid arguments and mm-hmm. points. Which goes again back to the points I'm trying, you know, to uh, to bring up with you is that the monopoly on violence, coercion, and aggression, and this yeah, is yeah. the nation state, and this is the totally, you know, central banking nation state, uh, you know, the W World Economic Forum with its, you know, uh, really shady, really mysterious uh, ads they do, and then they pull it back with you own nothing and you you'll be happy, and like what like how far would they go you know into this totalitarian tyrannical um condition this is the question i'm asking myself because bitcoin will be successful this is i have no doubt in my mind it's always it's already becoming i mean you know uh, the, the 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 pristine store of value and you know with all the uh, uh, accelerated technologies are evolving. Would it be Jack Mueller's strike, you know, and the final settlement layer transactions, you know, being done instantaneously on the Lightning Network? So it will, it will become like fast and faster as a medium of exchange and eventually a unit of account. Um, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah. So it's important to acknowledge that. Governments do have the monopoly on the use of force within a a given jurisdiction. And so ultimately, you are subject to, if you live within a jurisdiction, you are subject to the control of government in one way or another, as long as there is popular support for the measure and a kind of legal basis for for the action uh, if you live in a, a country like the UK. So I do see the root cause of the problem as being the opinions of the population, really. Um, I think that what's happened in the UK in terms of the the shift we've seen, arguably, I would say we've seen a shift uh, towards the left in uh, in our politics, um, including in the Conservative Party. You know, we have very uh, statist ideas now that have become mainstream in the conservative party um most people don't tend to look at the actual government spending that the conservatives are undertaking and the set of programs that they support and the set of policies they support um all stuff like you know minimum wage is now completely uh, mainstream policy for for everyone um across the political spectrum um and Things like this uh, mark a kind of shift towards the left in the general, uh, the kind of Overton window, if you like. But I think that's a result of the, the population. You know, these these representatives are democratically elected. And if people like Godfrey, Godfrey Bloom stand for, for office, uh, they might get a seat in the, uh, you know, uh, European Parliament, which is what he was part of previously, um, before we left the EU but they don't tend to get a lot of major traction uh, across the across um, the country and i think that's partly because people are really scared you know godfrey bloom had a bit uh, had a couple of um gaffes where he said a couple of silly things and uh, people tend to react really badly to that and view that sort of stuff as more important than actually what the policy prescriptions are and i always tend to focus on on the the policy prescriptions because those are the things that affect uh, tens of millions of people, um, whereas you know gaffes might be uh, setting a bad example, but uh, they don't profoundly affect people's lives in the same way that 
um, that, you know, for example, um, massive government programs or massive government policy changes do. Um, so how far will it go? I think um, it can go a lot further than it has. I think that the stuff that you're referring to regarding the w, um, WEF and uh, uh, Klaus Schwab are pretty worrying. Um, I used to working in climate change, um, and I know a lot of the narrative has been uh, centered around how governments should kind of come together to respond to climate change. And I do think there's a, a legitimate concern there. Um, I think that there's a legitimate debate to be had about uh, the extent to which uh, climate change is, is harming the world and what should be, what should be done about that. But one thing that I've become quite skeptical about having worked in this area is the actual efficacy of the government programs and what's suff what, what it costs to undertake these, um, these interventions that we, that we plan. Um, cause if you actually look at the statistics on the way in which, you know, human well-being has changed over the over the past years. You know, the number of people that are dying from climate-related um, accidents, for example, uh, that's that's um, you know fallen <laughs> quite dramatically over the decades um, because nature itself is just a host hostile. You know, if we lived, if we had uh, no infrastructure, no interaction with other people, we were just left to fend for ourselves. You know, most of us, especially those of us living in uh, cold parts of the world would be dead within a few days. Nature is naturally not a nice um, kind of place for human beings. We have to cooperate. We have to develop capital. We have to develop infrastructure uh, in order to survive. And what we've seen is that although there have been uh, changes in the climate, the extent to which we've been able to adapt and overcome those uh, you know, any difficulties that have resulted, which again, that's, that's controversial, but uh, if we assume there have been um, difficulties as a result of climate change so far, um, then the extent to which we've been able to adapt by um, capital accumulation and economic development have far outweighed um, those, those um, problems uh, in terms of actual kind of metrics that you can, that you can measure like, um, uh, you know, number of deaths related to climate stuff. So, what I'd say on, on the kind of Klaus Schwab idea that we need to have this great reset to where there's more government intervention, we take very large interventions related to climate change, is just that I view that with immense skepticism. Because when you actually look at how the programs operate, um, I think it's pretty hard to argue that they're, that they're effective and that they have any you know, rational way of actually measuring their, their impact especially relative to the amount that they cost. Um, <laughs> so without going into too much detail, I would just say that that's something that I think we should be deeply skeptical of and uh, that, that we need to review carefully before lending our support to. Right. And it's not, of course, you know, we could go much deeper into that, but let's just leave it at that. I mean, it's just not the World Economic Forum. It's this consortium, this, this collusion of <laughs> supranational organizations with their you call them, you know, self-appointed or self-elected. Uh, uh, we have with no accountability whatsoever, beginning with the Bank of International Settlements, the yeah. central bank of all central banks. Um, what is your take on all these, you know, um, entities um, pulling like strings? I mean, without going into conspiracy theory, but they do, you know, I mean, they do decide the fate of of eight billion people, literally, when it comes to to monetary policies, you know, to inflation, to um, uh, um, systemic theft. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I think the world is becoming more and more globalized, um, despite what is what is said. There are obviously forces of protectionism sort of brewing around, and I think you saw that a bit with Trump, which was, uh, you know, a policy that I I didn't agree with uh, at all. That you should. I don't think it's an effective way to to uh, make your country stronger, to impose tariffs on other countries. I, I believe in free trade. Um, but I think more and more we're going to move towards this kind of globalize, globalization. And it is remarkable, really, the extent to which governments use 
pretty similar models all around the world. Um, there aren't that many examples of, of um, you know, governments where there's there's a hyper hyper different model to the norm with like the central banking and and the kind of services that government provides. Um, you see some good examples like Singapore and Hong Kong and Switzerland, where they do have slightly different models and they, they do a lot better as a result. But generally speaking, all of these governments have similar interests. They, they, they have a similar worldview. They believe that the market economy is bad and that it needs to, to, con to be controlled and that they are the wise people that are able to manipulate the economy in a way that makes society better. And of course, that narrative gives them a lot of power and it gives them a lot of prestige because one of the key things that we look for in our employment is to feel like we are um, intelligent and that we are valuable and that we are doing something that's good for the world. And of course, this idea that, you know, you can go and volunteer at your local um, soup kitchen or whatever um, might appeal to some people, uh, well, does appeal to a lot of people, but to a greater number of people, they want to kind of change the world. They want to have these big um, macro impacts. And so there's something in human psychology that drives people to want to um, work with these kinds of organizations. They feel very powerful and important. And they've got this whole sort of school of, of thought that, that backs up their, their, their narrative that they want to portray, which is kind of grounded in... Um, you know, the mainstream view of, of economics and, and, and the noble role that governments ought to play in regulating society. Um, so they do have a lot of common interests and it seems to me that they are playing more and more of a role in our lives. I mean, the most prominent, prominent one um, would be the World Health Organization and how that has basically every country in the world um, just looks to the World Health, Health Organization uh, for advice as to what they should do. And they have shown that their advice is incredibly powerful in having a profound impact on virtually every society in the world. And so uh, if you're someone that thinks that the uh, interventions that have happened as a result have done more harm than good, and, and I would count myself as, as someone that does, then that's, of course, a very um, worrying development. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Peter, uh, you've written um, in one of your Twitter threads. Uh, that's uh, which one? Which point is that? I think under section uh, when you when you talk about you know the taxation tax story, uh, you talk about one, Dominic Frisby's book Daylight Robbery. Yeah. And what really fascinates me, you know, as we as I'd mentioned before we started recording, is the technological innovation, which 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 can potentially and realistically emerge or usher you know into a new era of of technological innovation and this is something you know i always bring up i say um you know there's been so much development and and technological evolution in the realm of di digital technologies what we call information technology computer technologies ai machine learning but we haven't had and this is something also what Safed and Amuz in his book touches upon, I think on in page 96 to 98, which I love, which I really would love to talk to him about, right. is, is that, you know, he compares the La, La Belle Epoque, you know, the gold standards, uh, yeah. where there were more zero to one technological innovation in 19th century than versus the, the fiat system, uh, under the fiat system in the 20th century. And this is uh, the point you bring up, you say at this, at this time, Britain led the world in technological innovation, Physicist John, Jonathan Hubner, which I have actually taken a look at, at, his, at his paper, has argued the 19th century produced more innovations per capita than any other. As Safedan writes, our modern world was invented in the gold standard years preceding World War I. So my question to you is, if do you think if people, and this is, I, I guess, you know, I, I mean, I assume this is also the intention is that, so that people understand, begin comprehending what what it would mean for us as individual as an individual sovereign as an, as a society as a human civilization what it would mean on every level we can think of monetary wise economically socially technologically maybe even spiritually you know like on consciousness level or how we can evolve more into a more you know better society more ethical society um do you think once people understand like the chain reaction of what bitcoin can 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 unleash 
that more and more people would, uh, you know, would understand that, hey, this, this could be a system where we would work less, do a job where we could have really more fun doing what we, whatever we do, uh, work whatever, 15 to 20 hours per week, and, and live in a deflationary economy where we pay less and less and less for better and better products and services and more innovative products and services. Um, do you know where I'm going with this? <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's really interesting to compare the way people think about innovation today and the way people used to think about innovation. Because as you mentioned, during the 19th century, we had some, you know, really world-changing innovations, the electric motor, the commercial telegraph, uh, all the innovations in ships and railways, the motor vehicle, all of these things were happening under the gold standard. They were all happening at a time of deflation. And remember that one of the key arguments that is used by mainstream economists is that if you have, well, against deflation, is that if you have deflation, then people won't invest because they won't um, they'll just keep their money because if money is going to go up in value, then there's no need to invest because uh, you you don't need to get the return that you would get, greater return that you get from investment. And of course, we saw that um, you know empirically that just doesn't doesn't work out. It hasn't been shown to be to be the case. We all know from personal experience that we don't uh, you know tend to wait. A lot of people don't wait an extra year so their iPhone will be cheaper. They want to have it now so they can enjoy the experience um, earlier. But in the 19th century, um, in Britain, in America, in Western Europe, there was a huge amount of uh, innovation going on. And it was all happening at a time when between, um, you know, CPI is, is, is not an exact measure. Um, but if you, if you trust the Bank of England's own data, then CPI fell about 30% between 1800 and 1900. And this was a period where Britain was going through the most radical um, transformation in, in terms of quality of life uh, for its people uh, in history. And all of these innovations were happening at the same time. You know, there was no government involvement in the vast majority of that. Um, as I say, government accounted for about 9% of GDP prior to the First World War in, in Britain. Um, there was no real systematic funding of science and innovation whatsoever. There were dribs and drabs, but the UK didn't have its first research council, government funded research council until, until 1913. Uh, if you look at the uh, US, then that really didn't kick off until they're entering into the Second World War in the 1940s. Again, you know, they had a few things like um, a few grants that went to, um, went to certain institutions, but very small stuff. So we seem to kind of accepted this, this dogma that the government needs to play a huge role in um, promoting uh, innovation in the economy and helping to develop technology. But I think that's a really um, problematic way to look at it. And I have to say that my, my opinions on this have, have shifted uh, quite a bit because I used to be very much part of the uh, interventionist camp with regard to, to innovation. I, I even used to work in this, this area uh, previously. Um, but having now looked at the evidence, uh, I do sympathize much more with people that that say that we should be leaving this kind of stuff to the to the market and i just don't think we consider the opportunity costs and the crowding out that is involved when we when we intervene in the economy so so in terms of in terms of bitcoin again because bitcoin limits transactions to voluntary transactions and it can't be printed. It can't be um, controlled in the same way that government currencies can. That just all of these revenue streams that you have that the, um, the government is creating, you know, they become much more voluntary. And in Daylight Robbery, this is one of the things that, that Dominic Frisbee talks about. He talks about having to move um, towards a system where, you know, you could potentially have tiers of, of, of citizenship. Like, um, you know, you can say, I want to have like, the basic services. I want to be able to use the roads. I want to be able to, um, you know, come in and out of the country whenever I want. And there's a price for that. And there could be another price that's like, okay, well, I want to have contribute to the healthcare service and I want to have the education service. Um, this is one kind of idea that he, he plays around with a bit. Um, 
I think that's perhaps not immediately <laughs> realistic just due to where, where the kind of zeitgeist is uh, for, for the population. But what Bitcoin does is it, it moves us kind of gradually towards a more voluntary and peaceful world where coercion becomes less of an option. And I think that there could be some, some, uh, some turbulence, but once people start to really see uh, the positive impact that deflationary currency can have on the well-being of society, on increasing the size of the pie for everyone, then um, you know, I, I, I guess I, I remain optimistic that, that people will, will appreciate that and uh, come to support um, Bitcoin's implementation or Bitcoin's kind of uh, use within society um, much more. Yeah. And, you know, Peter, I think people have a hard time because they, you know, they lack the knowledge of the company because we have really haven't had even our parents or grandparents, maybe even, you know, didn't really have the opportunity or the, you know, to, to live in a, in a, in a society <laughs> rooted in a hard, hard money. Yeah. So we can't really compare. We can't really, we don't have a reference point. Otherwise, people would just wake up one day and say, hey, this, this, we don't even need it. What do we need a universal basic income? If we have a money that is that satisfied as at least, you know, my existential needs and I can save and I, and, and everything, you know, appreciates in value, in my money appreciates in value and everything becomes cheaper and cheaper and everything becomes more, you know, productive and more innovative uh, on every level. You know, I'm, I'm like, you know, this is why I said there's, uh, it's funny, you know, we, we never uh, hardly ever ask ourselves the question, why in the last hundred years or more, haven't we seen any like zero to one technological innovation in the sectors of transportation, energy or whatever, you know, hmm. uh, <laughs> why do we still have burning? Why do we, we we're still burning fuel combustion engines, whatever that is, you know, jet engines propulsion or, 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 or the, the rockets that, that Elon Musk is sending to the, to the moon or to Mars, uh, hopefully soon, but <laughs> it's still burning fuel. So, uh, and the technology is there that the, the, and this is what I'm saying about, you know, also about the military industrial complex. There's a lot of compartmentalized technological innovation going on, but uh, un, un, unfortunately, totally like compartmentalized and not disclosed to the public yet. And, you know, we just need to see the ads of uh, what all, you know, all these robotics, you know, from uh, 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 what's the, what's this corporation called? Um, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't come to my mind at, at the moment, but you know, I'm saying the, all these, so I'm like, if they already have developed all these uh, prototypes that look like super like futuristic, I mean, what are, what kind of technologies already have they, have they at least, you know, as a prototype developed, which could be, um, you know, which we could be further developed with, with thousands of other Elon Musk type uh, mm. people, you know? Yeah. I, I think the key thing is that, you, if you eliminate waste in society, if you eliminate activities that are not adding value to society, like take foreign exchange, for example, I think, um, you know, trillions of pounds, uh, trillions of dollars of um, value is exchanged to foreign exchange markets every day, but, and huge numbers of people are employed in that sector, typically on very high salaries. But if you realize that that's completely unnecessary, um, because there's no need for the world to have uh, separate monies in every country. In fact, that's a completely social uh, government construct and arguably one that creates a huge amount of inefficiency for international trade. Then things like that are just freed up. All of those talented people who are, you know, very talented and, and you know, um, I'm sure, you know, very well-meaning people, uh, they're, they're, just guided by the incentives that they have that this is the way the world works and this is what the the market as they see it rewards them for doing and so they're drawn to towards those occupations but if we had a world in which there was just a single um currency kind of like we we used to obviously there was a lot less international trade but there was significant international trade during the time of the, the gold standard um, then all of that kind of inefficiency associated with different currencies is eliminated and and that frees up um, intelligent people to pursue other uh, meaningful, valuable things for society. And um, whatever it happens to be, you know, it could be more uh, Elon Musk type type projects or, or whatever. It could be more Amazon like projects, more iPhones or, or 
you know, of course, we can, we can never predict exactly what's going to what's going to happen. Otherwise, things wouldn't be uh, real innovations. But yeah, I think it's inevitable that we see more, um, you know, zero to one to use Peter Thiel's uh, terminology innovations. And um, uh, that can only make society um, much more, much better off. Yeah. Peter, I'd love to have have you back back on on my show. Um, and, and, and Emil Stansted, whom I just had recently on my show, he said he would love to have a panel discussion with you and other you know Bitcoiners. And there are some really still specific questions and topics I want to go really deeper down the rabbit hole with you. But um, unfortunately, I have to you know um, I have to we have to wrap it up because we have a newborn beautiful baby girl. <laughs> we have, have, have to take <laughs> yes, congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, she was born on January seventh, so. Um, yeah. So any, do you have any final thoughts or anything, you know, my listeners, uh, you want to direct, uh, my listeners to resources, links, or any, any final thoughts you have? Well, listeners can follow me at the Austrian three on Twitter. And as you've referred to, I have a medium page, which has got about 10 of my collated threads. So if you want to learn more about what I've discussed today, um, take, take a look at those. And uh, keep a lookout for new material. I've got some new stuff uh, coming out in, in the next few days as well. Uh, so uh, keep a lookout for that. And, and I'd say as well, uh, if this is one of the earlier podcasts you're listening to from uh, Kayvan, uh, do check out his other stuff. Uh, he's got some really quality stuff, um, done loads of podcasts. So I'd encourage listeners to, to check out more of your own material. Well, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Well, Peter, it was really a pleasure talking to you. Really insightful, really educational, and hope to you know let's stay in touch and we'll you know hopefully get on a beautiful panel discussion, very thrilling panel discussion in the near future. Yeah, absolutely. Let's do that. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Great. Thanks for having me on. Bye, Bye Peter. Take care. All right. Hope you love this episode i really enjoyed this um he's a fantastic you know educator and uh super knowledgeable about the Austrian economics and and especially about his background you know uh, spent 10 years in china so i also want to refer you to the uh, episode which he just recently did with uh daniel prince on his podcast show which i'm thrilled to listen to uh where he dives a little bit into other aspects this is why i, I didn't want to repeat you know all the other points now and uh, more you know emphasize the points which haven't been really covered so it's really insightful and thrilling to hear his thoughts and yeah, let me know what you think. Please follow Peter Young on Twitter, Medium. I'm going to put those in the show notes and subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platform. If you love this episode, please leave a five-star review on iTunes or Apple Podcast. Uh, you can also, you know, uh, uh, follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, Telegram, what have you. So thank you so much again for your support and for listening. And if you have any desires or wishes for any other special guests or panel discussions, please let me know. My email address is hello at the totalconnected.com or kd at kivandavani.com, all in the show notes. So thank you so much again, and I'll see you soon.